Um, I should first uh, mention to those of you in the audience that I would understand if some of you are looking skeptically up at the stage now, thinking that uh, you were expecting a different person named um, Robert Reich. Uh, he teaches at Berkeley, and um, if you came expecting him, I'm sorry to disappoint you before I even started my presentation. Um, uh, if it's any consolation, although I am lesser in stature, I'm significantly greater in height. <laughs> if you've been attending any of the sessions the past couple days, it seems to me one of the themes of the Aspen Ideas Festival so far is to explore deep anxieties about the health of democratic institutions. A session yesterday, will, the Ameri will American democracy survive the internet? A lunchtime session today on has democracy run its course? And part of the presentation I want to make today is designed to give you yet further reason for anxiety about democracy, and this time from an unexpected source. What I want to do is explore the ways in which philanthropy, especially big philanthropy in the form of foundations, can be seen, in fact, should be seen as in tension with democratic values. Um, what I want to suggest to you in the spirit of some philosophical and Socratic provocation is that big philanthropy is not something we should react to as citizens with gratitude always and everywhere, but something that we should react to with scrutiny and indeed sometimes skepticism. Um, here at the Aspen Ideas Festival, perhaps this is um, a, a topic of some surprise. I know there are some people who work for large foundations and are themselves big donors in the audience. Um, so I want to begin by saying that the end of my talk will offer a particular redemption of big philanthropy, a form of redemption where I think philanthropy can indeed serve democratic values, even if it's a particular mode of philanthropic action that I think is infrequent, uh, infrequently seen these days. And I'll also confess up front that uh, operating in a kind of Socratic provocateur mode, I'll assume that the conventional opinion in your head, or certainly in my judgment in the head of most people in the American citizenry today, is to treat philanthropists among us with gratitude and admiration. And since I don't think the case needs to be made especially well about why gratitude might be one response to philanthropy, I'll want to emphasize, at least in my initial remarks, why it is, I think, that scrutiny and skepticism is also an appropriate attitude towards philanthropy. So my presentation has four parts. I'll talk for no more than 30 minutes and then open it up to discussion. Um, in order to hopefully unearth from your own intuitions and dig out of your thinking some skeptical thoughts of your own, I want to tell three stories that are designed to arouse scrutiny and skepticism about big philanthropy and how philanthropy can be in tension with democratic aspirations, democratic values. I'll then turn to a quick anatomy, I'll call it, of the existence of the private foundation, which includes a little look at its history in the United States. Third, I'll offer this, I said, a redemption, a particular defense of what philanthropy can do that doesn't sit in tension with democracy, but rather has the promise to enhance democratic values. And then if you haven't been convinced or at the very least sufficiently provoked by anything I've had to say about foundations, I'll end with a short story about a, a really bizarre institutional design that I'll suggest initially is the private foundation and then reflect upon a very bizarre institutional design that people like me have, namely tenure, lifetime unaccountable job performance, <laughs> and try to suggest that the operation of foundations is not unlike the institutional design of having tenure as a way of finalizing the story I want to give you. Okay, so uh, I said I'd start with three stories designed to elicit from you some intuitions that will give you reason to be skeptical or at least to scrutinize big philanthropy. So I want to begin by taking us back in time. Um, in the United States, the very form, the legal form of the foundation is a product of about 110 years ago. It came into existence in the early 1900s in the first Gilded Age when people like Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller had accumulated such fortunes that they sought to convert a large portion of their, portion of their fortune to a general philanthropic mission and 
because, and it's interesting to, to note this, because I think most people don't realize this today, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we hadn't yet evolved laws that codified something as a nonprofit corporate form or a for-profit corporate form. And in fact, if you wanted to set up something as general as the Rockefeller Foundation or the Carnegie Corporation, there was reason to go before Congress and seek formal authorization to create the Carnegie Corporation or the Rockefeller Foundation. So I want to tell you a little bit about what happened when John D. Rockefeller in the 19 teens, 1913 to be exact, went off to Congress to ask for permission to form the Rockefeller Foundation. So Rockefeller's fortune was so large, and at the time he was so unpopular, that when he wanted in 1912 to create a foundation with a general purpose mission to benefit humanity, he went off to Congress to ask for a formal um, congressional authorization a deed of incorporation to create the foundation. In response to that request, the former president Theodore Roosevelt said, quote, no amount of charities in spending such fortunes as John D. Rockefeller's can compensate in any way for the misconduct in acquiring them in the first place. <laughs> Sitting President Taft called on Congress to oppose the creation of the foundation, describing the effort as, quote, a bill to incorporate Mr. Rockefeller himself. The American Federation of Labor's president, Samuel Gompers, offered this, quote, the one thing that the world would gratefully accept from Mr. Rockefeller now would be the establishment of a great endowment of research and education to help other people see in time how they can keep from becoming like him. <laughs> so here you see some expression of skepticism, indeed animus toward the man himself, Rockefeller. Other people express skepticism, not just of Rockefeller the man, but of the very idea of a foundation. So testifying before Congress in 1912, the Reverend John Haynes Holmes, who was a well-known Unitarian minister, helped to found the NAACP, served on many, for many years as the board chair of the American Civil Liberties Union, said the following, quote, I take it for granted that the men who are now directing these foundations, for example, the men who are representing the Rockefeller Foundation are men of wisdom, men of insight and of vision, and they're animated by the very best motives. My standpoint, however, is the whole thought of democracy. And from this standpoint, it seems to me that this foundation and its very character must be seen as repugnant to the whole idea of a democratic society." Unquote. That line, the idea that a, the very existence of a large philanthropic entity, a foundation, should be seen as repugnant to the very character of democratic society is a thought that today, I believe, seems completely alien, something we never see expressed in public, and indeed might be viewed as extreme. But the whole idea here, I think, is nothing more complicated, certainly in the moment, than the, than the following thought, that what a foundation represents, especially with a fortune as large as Rockefeller's, is the legal codification, indeed in certain respects, the legal promotion of a plutocratic voice in a democratic society. And why, might you ask, would it be seen as something desirable in the first instance in setting up healthy democratic institutions to give a standing place of privilege to people with extraordinary wealth to convert their private wealth into public influence? That's the sense, I think, in which John Haynes Holmes expresses the idea that foundations might be seen as repugnant to the whole idea of a democratic society. Final anecdote or historical um, passage from that time, Senator Frank Walsh from Missouri opposed not merely Rockefeller's foundation but all large foundations. He wrote in 1915, quote, my object is to state as clearly and briefly as possible why huge philanthropic trusts known as foundations appear to be a menace to the welfare of society. The idea here is that foundations are a deeply anti-democratic institution. They allow wealthy people a privileged place in converting their wealth into public influence. They give donor preference, legal standing beyond the death of the donor. They allow the foundation to exist in perpetuity. And the operation of the foundation 
if you attended the lunchtime panel today, there was a short conversation amongst um, some philanthropic leaders about how foundations operate largely unaccountably. And that's a story I want to develop a little bit here, um, leading, as I say, to a particular form of redemption for the unaccountable um, 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 design of foundations. All right, so the first lesson I want to draw from this historical episode is nothing more complicated than the fact that philanthropy, and in particular big philanthropy, represents an exercise of power in a democratic society. And rather than responding to power with gratitude, we should respond democratically to the exercise of power with skepticism and scrutiny, especially when it's big, concentrated, unaccountable power. All right, second story I want to tell you has to do not with an historical episode, but from our current day. Um, I don't know if there's anyone here from the Gates Foundation. If you're not from the Gates Foundation, you've probably heard of this episode as well. The Gates Foundation's episodes to uh, activities to stimulate education reform have stimulated some real resistance in various quarters, most especially from um, Diane Ravitch, who, because of the Foundation's successful efforts to insert themselves into educational policy debates, has described Bill Gates as the nation's unelected school superintendent. And while it's of course true that even the enormous resources of the Gates Foundation are nothing but a mere pittance relative to the public expenditures in education, the idea that school boards and indeed school superintendents have to stand regularly for election, in that respect are accountable to the public for the choices they make in expending the public's dollars, what, Diane Ravitch wonders, can one do if you don't endorse the preferred agenda of the Gates Foundation in education? You can write some op-eds in the newspaper, but there's no one to unelect. The Gates Foundation is not something that's democratically organized. And indeed, it doesn't compete with anybody else. There are no natural marketplace competitors for foundations. They exist not um, in order to serve their customers, so to speak, who have to then decide to purchase something. That's the reverse dynamic that's at work. Um, the foundation is providing something to the recipient, who often then exists in a sort of form of um, you know, deferential gratitude towards the donor, rather than a competitive dynamic, as you might see in the regular marketplace. So we have foundations that are um, unaccountable in some democratic sense and in a marketplace sense. I'll expand on that in a minute. But I'll offer another passage from someone in a much different sort of political quarter than Diane Ravitch. Um, the judge Richard Posner, who teaches at the University of Chicago, um, certainly not a man associated as being on the left of the political spectrum, wrote the following um, about the existence of foundations, not about the Gates Foundation in particular. He wrote, a perpetual charitable foundation is a completely irresponsible institution, answerable to nobody. It competes neither in capital markets nor in product markets, and unlike a hereditary monarch whom such a foundation otherwise resembles, it is subject to no political control either. The puzzle, he wondered, is why we do not view foundations as total scandals." Unquote. So the lesson I want to draw from these two passages is that we began with foundations as an exercise of power, and now I think we can add to it that foundations are an exercise of largely unaccountable, intergenerational, donor-directed power. And in many respects, although, the, for example, the Gates Foundation is a welcome exception from this, foundations have no demanding obligations to be transparent in how they operate. There's no requirement to have a website, no requirement to public reporting beyond a very modest and inscrutable tax form. So the sense in which we have demands for transparency in the operation of public agencies do not apply to foundations, and foundations are transparent at their own discretion. Okay, uh, final story designed to arouse, again, some skepticism, some scrutiny, um, comes from an episode about I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, um, an investigative journalist named Mark Dowie spent time with people in the um, orbit of George Soros as, his, he's, as he began to set up the array of philanthropic entities um, that are now are called the Open Society Institute. And um, you know, the typical way I think a foundation gets started these days and for the past generation has been an initial donor decides to hire a 
staff of people to help run the foundation. The staff initially tries to decide what the program areas are gonna be, the main efforts that the, the grant making will be devoted to, and then they open up shop, as it were, defining their interests and being transparent about that to other people to apply for grants. So at the tail end of this planning process, Mark Dowie relates the following episode where there was a final discussion, including George Soros and other people, about what the program areas were that they should devote themselves to. So there was evidently a disagreement around the table. And at one point, George Soros is allowed, alleged to have pounded his fist on the table and said something to the effect of, well, at the end of the day, this is my money, so we're gonna do it my way. At which point, a program staff person interjected gently that, excuse me, Mr. Soros, roughly half of the money in the foundation would have been in the US Treasury if you hadn't put it in the foundation. So perhaps other people should have a say, too. Um, he allegedly was fired the following week. No surprise there. And the idea here is that although many people construe philanthropy of any size as simply the exercise of the liberty of an individual to give away her money or property as she sees fit, given the array of tax benefits that attach to philanthropic activity, it's, I think, more accurate to describe philanthropy as the tax-subsidized exercise of liberty. Because, of course, without the tax breaks that attach to philanthropy, individuals would have the identical permission to give their money away to whatever purpose or cause they saw fit. Now, it's an open question about whether tax advantages or tax benefits elicit more philanthropic money than would be there without the tax breaks. And there's some interesting social science that goes in both directions about that. But the point here is that I wanna resist the idea that philanthropy is nothing more than the liberty of people to give away their own money. It's the tax subsidized exercise of that liberty. If you're skeptical about this, let me relate to you another anecdote that comes from um, a, a wonderful reporter named Dylan Matthews who writes for Vox.com. Uh, um, he's uh, what's known in the philanthropic world as an effective altruist, and so he wants to try to channel philanthropic assets to the most um, effective causes in the world. And so anytime he sees a $100 million gift go to a private university like Stanford with a $25 billion endowment or Harvard or Princeton or Yale, he writes an article in Vox that has the headline, he must have some template on his, on his computer that he just fills it in every time. Um, For the love of God, people, please stop giving money to Harvard. And most recently he wrote a piece about a gift to Stanford University last year uh, by Phil Knight, I think it was for $400 million, with this same headline. And he explained in the article that he thought the world would have been better off from the standpoint of human welfare if Phil Knight had taken the $400 million he'd given to Stanford, put it in his backyard, and set it afire. And I think the average response of a reader at that point is how could that possibly be seen as better for the world simply to burn $400 million? And the answer is that had Phil Knight done that, it would have been viewed as an act of private consumption. The $400 million would have been taxable, and he would have owed some money on that decision to the government in form of tax revenue. And comparing the outcome of $400 million to Stanford for the purpose Phil Knight designated it to the fractional amount of $400 million that would have gone to the US Treasury and the good that would have done, Dylan Matthews' view is it would have been better for the world to have had a fraction of that money go to the Treasury than to have given it to Stanford University. Okay, so either you're skeptical now as I am about the role that philanthropy plays in democracy or you're skeptical about the things that I've just been saying. And I'll close this opening overview just by saying that the point I wanna make is that we should see philanthropy as an exercise of power, an exercise of power that is largely unaccountable, often non-transparent, where the donor's preferences exist in principle and perpetuity. The language that often gets used here provocatively is that the preferences of the donor, even once dead, extend beyond the grave to strangle future, future generations. When you have a general purpose mission, of course the current um, you know, leadership of a foundation can change direction. But if the donor prescribes a very narrow purpose, 
Legally speaking, foundations are obligated to hew to that purpose even past the death of the donor. So exercise of power, largely unaccountable, often non-transparent, and not the exercise of liberty, strictly speaking, but the exercise of tax-subsidized liberty. All right, well, I've tried to arouse in you some reasons to react to big philanthropy, not just with gratitude, not just to celebrate it, but to think it seems like a very peculiar institutional arrangement in a democratic society to say to our fellow wealthy citizens, let's allow wealthy people a special institutional privilege in which we provide them a tax incentive to set up a legal entity to insert their plutocratic voice into a democratic society, use private wealth to affect the public sphere in a way that's largely unaccountable, often non-transparent, and in which their preferences exist beyond the grave. So what I want to suggest to you is that's an odd decision, democratically speaking. So um, I've tried to provide this initial information or this initial presentation in a way um, to a skeptical audience perhaps to give you the reasons that I think you ought to have some skepticism as well. And now I want to offer this redemptive argument, how it is I think we can view philanthropy not as in tension with democratic values, but as something that can enhance or promote democratic institutions themselves. So what I want to claim, perhaps on the surface paradoxically, is that the apparent vice of unaccountability can be turned into a democratic virtue. The argument here rests on the idea that foundations operate or can operate on a much different and longer time horizon than can businesses in the marketplace and elected officials in public institutions. And as a result, they can take risks in developing innovative social policy or various forms of experimentation that we should not expect to see routinely in the for-profit marketplace or in the state sector and government. What I want to suggest is that foundations can represent an extra governmental form of democratic experimentalism. And insofar as what foundations do is pilot things that are over a long time horizon that we shouldn't expect for-profit businesses to do or the state to do itself, and when foundations pilot some risky, socially innovative policies, subject them to various forms of empirical testing, and present those successful innovations for, uh, to a, a public for a stamp of democratic legitimacy, then what foundations can do is redeem themselves um, as enhancing a form of experimentalism and innovation in a democratic society, rather than exist as a form of plutocratic or technocratic voice um, overlaid with the democratically um, organized voice of citizens. So, Here's a, a quick overview of that argument, and then I'll conclude and open it up to questions um, in just a moment. So I want you to begin with an un, what I think is an uncontroversial supposition. Imagine that in a democratic state, um, the citizens and the representatives wish to advance the general welfare or pursue the aims of justice however they're understood, but because democratic representatives and citizens themselves don't always know the best means for achieving those aims, either at any given moment, or as especially as um, social conditions change over time, people should ask themselves, it's an open question, what kinds of policies and programs will, for example, best promote educational opportunity and achievement or um, you know, enhance environmental sustainability? On that former question, you know, as you all know in the audience, some people believe that universal preschool is the best kind of effort right now to promote uh, educational opportunity. Other people think a better school finance system. Other people are laying bets on various forms of online learning or technologically um, enhanced uh, education. It's not obvious what would be um, the ideal policy, and you can multiply these kinds of examples across all kinds of policy domains. My suggestion is that a democratic society, recognizing that its leaders and indeed its citizens aren't all-knowing, and that reasonable disagreement will always exist in the best means to pursue just ends, and further that social conditions are always evolving, Citizens might wish to stimulate and to decentralize innovation and experimentation in social policy so that better and more effective policies at realizing democratically agreed upon aims can be identified and adopted. The idea here, to use the language that philanthropists would use, is that 
Foundations might serve as the risk capital for democracy, or more prosaically, that foundations can take a long time horizon. They can decide to try to innovate something over a course of a 20-year time horizon, a 50-year time horizon even, in a way that public officials in the state are much more unlikely to do because they have to stand for election. If they have nothing to show for themselves after two years, four years, six years, they're much less likely to win re-election. In sum, foundations, free of both marketplace or electoral accountability regimes, answerable to the diverse preferences and ideas of the donors, and with a protected endowment designed to exist across generations, are perhaps uniquely situated to engage in the sort of high-risk, long-run policy innovation and experimentation that is healthy in democratic societies and that addresses the interests of future generations. And when foundations operate in this mode, they're not merely compatible with democratic ideals, but can support and even enhance them. What kinds of examples might I point to? Um, well, the classic case here is the Carnegie-supported um, library system, which was you know, not funded in perpetuity by the Carnegie Corporation, but offered up as a kind of social policy innovation that was presented to a democratic public, and then now it is indeed is funded in general by citizens who ask their representatives to fund libraries as a public function. Um, the 911 system is a similar sort of thing, initially pilot tested by a foundation and then taken up as a public service. The key here in my view, however, is that philanthropists, and this is what I often don't see in the contemporary sphere, contemporary world of philanthropy, philanthropists should be, as it were, pilot testing new ideas, new innovations in social policy that audition for a stamp of democratic legitimacy. So rather than offering up new ideas to a democratic public in which people sometimes describe philanthropy as the smarter sector, a technocratically driven insertion of wisdom into an inefficient and ossified public regime, philanthropists should seek the stamp of democratic approval by showing how their empirically tested innovations ought to be brought to scale either by the marketplace or more likely by the public, because no foundation has the means to sustain a new innovation for everyone at scale over the course of time. Okay, let me conclude with what this, you know, perhaps odd analogy was that I offered at the start, namely, I wanna to try to offer an analogy between what foundations do and what it is that tenure is for people at universities. So on occasion when I present um, the first half of this talk, especially to audiences who work in big foundations, uh, I've encountered um, skepticism, occasionally anger, irritation, and rather than begin there, which is not always a pleasant place for a presenter to begin, I'll sometimes say, let's talk about something else that my guess is you're already skeptical about, namely what I have, which is a very peculiar job arrangement called tenure. A seven-year period of probation after which I have lifetime, lifetime unaccountable job performance. I could stop publishing, and short of you know, breaking laws or failing to fulfill the minimal teaching obligations that any tenured professor has, there's no job accountability for tenured professors. And in my experience, at least, the typical attitude of people in foundations, the typical attitude of most people I meet, is that tenure is a completely bizarre and unjustified institutional design. How could it be a good thing to allow professors to have unaccountable job performance for life. And what I want to suggest here is that there are a variety of different arguments for tenure. One of them is about allowing professors complete freedom of speech and that um, allowing various forms of oversight and scrutiny, including um, sanctions for job performance based upon unpopular things that professors say, um, that's a worry. And that's one justification for tenure. But I think the more powerful one has to do with the idea that what professors get to do post-tenure, at least in principle, is take a long time horizon view about how they should develop their own research interests. And unlike industry and unlike working in government, if a tenure professor decides he or she wishes to become the world's expert on the tiniest little patch of intellectual territory, which might take 30 or 40 years to become, that's a welcome thing to do for the, for the professor. And after 10 years, there's nothing yet to show for that professor. The answer is, well, I'm still learning. I had to learn three languages. I had to do all this field work. I had to try to go in the library and work out some mathematical um, proof. That's not gonna happen in other places. Most people are gonna fail at those attempts, 
But those that succeed will add to the storehouse of knowledge, and that's a socially important function. If it turns out that what professors do with tenure is nothing more than modest incremental additions to knowledge, turn out a commentary on this paper, a little small thing on someone else, you could put all of us on five-year renewable contracts and nothing about our output would change. If what professors do with tenure is that, tenure in my view is not justified. What tenure is good for is thinking long time horizon in risky research undertakings, many of which are likely to fail. If that's an argument for tenure, that's the argument I want to offer for foundations. It's a narrow argument for foundations. So that if a foundation is giving money to a soup kitchen to serve the people who are hungry, that's not a good use of a big foundation's assets. That's what we can do with our pocketbook charity. But if you have a foundation staff that's funneling money to do small ball proven things already, you should fight for that elsewhere, either through your direct writing as a, as a check, as a charitable donor, or by asking for the marketplace or the public agencies to support that. Foundations are distinctively suited for experimentalism over the long run. And if they don't operate in that mode, I myself am skeptical that the array of protections, the unaccountability, non-transparency, tax subsidized liberty for donor preferences beyond the grave may be an institutional design not worth supporting in a democratic society. So let me end there, hoping that I've stirred up, in this audience in particular, um, some reaction, some um, argument, and I'd love to hear your own questions and reactions. Thank you. I see a hand over here. Am I, am I supposed to wait for a microphone? Yeah, go ahead. John Debs, I'm in the Distinguished Careers Institute at Stanford, so maybe I'll take your course. Anyways, yeah. um, two thoughts. One, Ford Foundation, Pew Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, they have to be turning over their grade. They, th those foundations are not doing right. what those gentlemen did in their life. The second thing is maybe you should think about foundations on a spend down like the Osher Foundation, you know, where by 10 years after his death, the foundation has, has been liquidated. So I don't think it's, I think there's a lot more range than maybe you're presenting. I know you only have a fair amount of time, but right. that's what struck me when I was listening to your presentation. Yeah, uh, so it's certainly the case that there are some foundations where as you described it, the initial donor um, is turning over in his grave, witnessing what the current incarnation of the foundation is doing. I'd suggest that that's only the case in foundations where the mission of the foundation, as established by the donor, was sufficiently broad to allow a capacious interpretation of that mission by future generations. Because donors are permitted to have very narrow causes as well. And there, the discretion that future leaders of the foundation have is much more limited. So there's a danger, as it were, for a living donor establishing a foundation and announcing a great broad mission um, that the future leadership of the foundation might decide to interpret that much differently. Um, uh, in, the, in Ford's case, uh, you're exactly right to think that there was a, um, um, something more than horror at what the foundation has become. And Darren Walker is supposed to be here at some point this week. I don't know if he's here in the room, but you know, he can speak eloquently about the, um, um, how aghast Henry Ford would be for a gay black man now to be running the Ford Foundation. Um, your other point was about spend down, and that's a good point too. Uh, my reaction to that would be nothing more than that's entirely, again, at the discretion of the donor. So there is an in, indeed an increasing tendency. I wouldn't say it's widespread. I wouldn't even think it's a movement yet. But some very prominent larger foundations have announced a commitment to spend down, if not in the lifetime of the initial donor, at least in the short time horizon after the death of the donors. And that's an interesting model itself that deserves some attention. Um, the vast majority of foundations, to the best of my knowledge, are set up in e initially with the legal default of perpetuity. So in other words, um, perpetuity is the default legal arrangement. You have to affirmatively opt in to a spend down model. And since the vast majority of foundations aren't at the size of the, you know, the billions of dollars, um, they're much, much smaller, um, they're, in, in my limited uh, examination of the, the data there, not many of them are spend down. Shall I call on people, or is there someone in the room who can see, see people better than I can? Please, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Jane Daly, University of Chicago. I think maybe you have to um, 
distinguish between pre-16th Amendment foundations and post-16th Amendment uh -huh. foundations. So, you know, Carnegie thought that a man who died with a, with a fortune was a failure. Right. But he was living in a world with no income tax. Right. Uh, so was Rockefeller. Carnegie was happy to pay income tax. Rockefeller, less so. Uh, today's foundations, one could make the argument that the money that they're putting in it isn't entirely their own money, that they're putting the people's money into their foundations because we have a tax structure that is so tilted in favor of the wealthy right. who themselves, through their politics, like to keep it that way. Yeah. Uh, that's what I take the point of the Mark Dowie anecdote about Soros to be, namely that when Soros says, well, God damn it, it's my money, we're gonna do it my way, and the junior program officer says, actually, Mr. Soros, 40% of it or 50% of it would have been in the treasury if you hadn't given it here. You're exactly right. Foundations represent the spending of partly private assets, the, the, the wealth of the donor, um, but partly public assets in the form of foregone tax revenue. And insofar as you think that foundations should be more accountable, especially more accountable publicly, the tax subsidy, I think, is the best argument for it. Namely, that because of the fact that we as citizens collectively subsidize the creation and operation of foundations, and decentralize the spending power of our elected representatives to the discretion of the donor alone, that's an odd thing to do on the surface, and it might give some good reason to think that those tax benefits allow some form of, um, if not fully public governance, at the very least, a more robust form of accountability than exists now. I'll, I'll add here, you probably know this story perhaps better, better than I do, when Rockefeller was initially going to Congress asking for the authorization by Congress for the creation of the Rockefeller Foundation, ultimately he failed. Congress refused to allow him to create it. He went back to New York State and asked the New York State legislature to create the foundation and they said yes. But he proposed as a compromise to the US Senate that he would um, cap the foundation at 50 years. He would say that there would be no more, I think it was then $100 million in the foundation and most importantly from my point of view, that the governance of the foundation wouldn't be his hand-picked family and uh, philanthropic advisors, but um, several US senators, the presidents of Yale, Harvard, and Princeton, and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States as the trustees of the foundation, potentially setting up a template for the private foundation in the United States that would have been partly a public governance model. The failure of the US Congress, in my view, to um, approve that might have led to the fully privatized form of, pri of philanthropy we have today. Fully privatized in the sense of um, the Gates Foundation can be governed by Bill, Melinda, and Warren Buffett, and is it Bill's father is the fourth trustee, I think. Um, that's a private form of governance, not a public form of governance. I think you make a very good argument, and I was wondering, what, what would you say about the charitable tax deduction? That's my first question. And the second one is many, many foundations are just very small, you know, less than 10 or $8 million. How can they do this long range kind of right. uh, justification that you talked about? Yeah. All right, so two questions. The charitable tax deduction and the fact that there are very many small foundations, how can they carry out this experimentalism um, that I was describing? So first of the charitable tax deduction, I mean, ultimately I think this is an empirical question by which I mean the following. Is it the case that the existence of a tax deduction kicks out of a donor's wallet more money than she would have given in the absence of a tax deduction? And there's varying evidence about that. Um, for very, very wealthy people, the tax benefit in many cases tends to run out and they're giving millions of dollars more to philanthropy without any tax benefit at all. And if you're at the lunchtime conversation today about foundations, there's the, you know, the maybe not exactly novel arrangement of um, people who are uh, um, rejecting the foundation form all, altogether and creating an LLC. This is the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Emerson Collective, and Omidyar Network, where there's no tax benefit at all for the creation of those entities. Um, and some people say, well, we give money away whether there's a tax break or not, or, or, or to put it more directly, um, my motivation as a, as a philanthropist is not to minimize my tax bill, it's to do good in the world. And I would wanna do good in the world whether or not I was getting a tax break or not. Other people claim that the tax breaks are hugely consequential in eliciting more philanthropic money than would be given otherwise. 
Um, the best empirical evidence that I'm aware of shows that whether or not the tax breaks are actually, actually kicking out more money depends to a large extent on the kind of cause people are giving to. So one thing that I think a lot of people aren't aware of, when I started researching this I wasn't aware of, is that of the th roughly $370 um, uh, million dollars given away in the United States last year, billion dollars given away last year, um, almost half of it by living donors was given to religion or to the church. Um, and not for a faith-based social service, but just to the regular you know, Sunday, Sunday basket offering. Um, because most people understand giving to their congregation as something in the form of an obligation, they're probably not going to stop giving the money they give to the church if the tax break goes away. Whereas giving to cultural institutions and to places like Stanford are more likely to be pretty dependent on the tax incentives. All right, so that's the charitable tax deduction. You asked about small foundations. So I have, I think, a, um, a counterintuitive view about the existence of small foundations. Given that the defense of foundations that I offered was about this long time horizon innovation, I think rather than there being a ceiling on the size of foundations, there should be a floor. And I don't have a particular number to give you, but if you create a foundation with $500,000, I think the likelihood that you can engage in serious experimentation if you're only giving out 5% a year is more or less non-existent. You should, you should write charitable, charitable contributions out of your checkbook rather than creating a foundation. Um, nothing about the world would be changed, and in fact, there'd be a, it's a lower overhead rate because the foundation form itself requires a bunch of maintenance and support. So my view is that there should be a floor on the size of foundations. Many fewer foundations and the ones that, there, that exist are staffed by people who are professionals, meaning people who are capable of thinking over the long time horizon and subjecting those innovations to some sort of experiments and testing, and then presenting those as if they were auditioning for a stamp of democratic approval. Over here. Uh, hi, uh, Steve Patrick. I run something called the Forum for Community Solutions here at the Aspen Institute. I came here from three jobs in philanthropy, uh, and I, you know, running the Community Solutions Program, I'm, I fundamentally self-identify as grassroots. Yep. And then I woke up one morning and I was at the largest philanthropy in the history of humanity. So my joke is about I came to Aspen, uh, you know, to get closer to the ground. Um, <laughs> so. You started down the path. I, I, I would be curious, how do you just democratize philanthropy more? You know, and you've, you've shared some ideas, but it seems to me like if we increase the payout from 5% requirement from the IRS, even to six, because yeah. uh, right now the payout ends up being less because people count admin, et cetera. Right. If you said you know, a board structure has to have representation, uh, you know, one of the many times I almost got fired at the Gates Foundation was for, was for suggesting people like John Powell and, and others should join the board because that would democratize. But it, I think there are probably 10 or so policy plays that would actually very much democratize the institution in a way that would be effective. So I'd love you to comment on that. And then t I think it's now 12% of the economy is the nonprofit sector. Right. And so how do you kind of grapple with that in the context of doing away with uh, institutionalized philanthropy. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't say that I wished to do away with institutionalized philanthropy. I said there was a particular defense I was eager to make for it that would narrow, in certain respects, the way it currently operates. Um, and the democratizing elements that you were describing, uh, I would characterize as interesting ways, of, but more or less on the margins. And the kind, the, the way in which I want philanthropy to, democratize, to be democratized is not by um, making big foundations fully publicly accountable through public governance models, um, as if it, philanthropy was nothing more than the effort of our elected representatives to supervise the spending of money in, in foundations, but rather to encourage foundations to um, have the attitude that they are serving democratic institutions and values themselves rather than um, operating around them because it, the very problem they see is that democratic institutions are overly bureaucratic, inefficient, ossified. Um, philanthropists should seek to serve democracy itself, which it can do by operating over a time horizon that people within government or the marketplace are unlikely to operate themselves. Let me put this slightly differently. To go back to the analogy of tenure, if you said, Tenure is a very bizarre arrangement. There's no democratization of scholarship. 
if what you said about my scholarship, any other professors in the room scholarship, is that in order to um, continue to get my contract renewed, even after getting tenure, I had to submit a portfolio of my work to the judgment of my peers over time. Well, that wouldn't be tenure as we know it. If I had always to seek the approval, formally or just reputationally, of my fellow scholars, well, part of what tenure is supposed to be good for is the idiosyncratic thinker who breaks away from the sheep-like disciplinary thinking, you know, as represented in scholarship, and champions a new path. It's in my view, good for philanthropy to be idiosyncratic and insulated from a certain forms of public accountability so long as the philanthropists see themselves as serving democratic institutions themselves rather than subverting them. Uh, to put it perhaps um, um, in a way which I guess is modestly un uncharitable, but I'll, I'll put it out there anyway. Um, I think that what democracy can try to do is to domesticate plutocrats to serve democratic institutions. Right here. Uh, so uh, I am wondering, I, I'm as, as, a, as a very grateful beneficiary of big bets from big foundations right. uh, in a very unsexy area for a lot of people, criminal justice reform and specifically around anti-recidivism and re-entry, uh, helping people come out of prison into society in a way that the general public doesn't seem to care about, uh, would, not, would, would not support through tax dollars at right. this point. I wonder what the alternative is. I don't know of the foundations that are personal fiefdoms that are not serving the public good. And so I just, I wonder, I, I, I appreciate the arguments against in a sense, but I, I wonder what the plausible, uh, sustainable alternative would be for things like the, the, what I do, which, I, which I, I have to believe, given time, the public will come on board and will support in a way that will, you know, the, 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 the situation currently is terrible, right. and we could turn it around. Yeah. Yeah. It, I'm going to give a response that I, th I think is directed at, at your question, but if, I, if I'm missing the point, um, please interrupt again. Um, uh, one question I think it's interesting to ask is whether philanthropy should be something that aims to be self-liquidating. It's a remedial activity in democratic society attempting to mop up a bunch of problems that ideally should be solved and taken care of elsewhere. Um, if the example you were giving about people who are coming out of prison and then thinking about recidivism, um, if you think, for example, that um, the folks that you work with ought not in the ideal arrangement be dependent upon the largesse of philanthropists to support the programs that you are concerned to run. And that ideally these would be provided in some other mechanism, perhaps through the state, maybe perhaps through the marketplace. Um, the philanthropy that's now at work there to support the work that you do might be thought to aim for its own um, irrelevance in the future. That's an interesting mode of philanthropy. And um, if that's the case, then what I'd like to hear from the donors, the philanthropists themselves, is the strategy to help bring about a day when the kinds of donations that they're making are no longer necessary because the problem will have been solved, rather than the continual application of philanthropic money to a problem whose solution lies outside of philanthropy. Hi, Rob, here. Yeah, there. <clears throat> um, I was sent by the Gates Foundation to silence you. Please. <laughs> um, I was the guy making those education grants with that guy over there who didn't admit it, but yeah. I'll admit it. Um, when we gave Joel Klein in New York City $250 million, we didn't walk into his office with a shotgun and said, you will take this money. Right. And we didn't do that anywhere. Yeah. And in fact, what I think you miss on the accountability piece is that philanthropy, if done right with a grantee, is a transaction. It's a negotiation. Certainly, the Gates Foundation and other big philanthropy have their interests and their agenda that they want to fund. And certainly, you can engage in a dance of deceit where you 
where you corrupt the aspiration of somebody you fund with the power of your brand and the power of the amount of money you have. But when it's done well, you are listening to the aspiration of the person you fund, right. the leader you fund, the institution you fund, and you enter into a contract right. of free will and openness and transparency. Right. And you agree to a set of outcomes that that funding will produce. Right. And so I would argue, having been on both sides of the dollar, because before I went to Gates, I ran two very large school districts. And I tried very hard to get Gates money. The only way I could do it is, was to work for them. But, <laughs> but when you accept any outside money in a public district in the United States of America, you have to have the elected school board unless it's appointed by a mayor who is typically elected. Right. It has to be approved by either that elected school board or by the mayor or by the city council, or if it's a state, often by the governor or some other elected official. So it's not as if those dollars can enter into public system without, without elected people determining whether they would accept it or not. Right. So that's my other, that's my one piece. And my second piece is I, I now lead the Arizona Community Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's a very red state, if you hadn't noticed. Now, people there think a dollar sent to the government is the worst investment they could make right. ever. They believe it deep in their hearts. And they believe that they can do better making the choices themselves than leaving it to strangers elsewhere, whether it be the state house or the federal government. But that is a deeply held belief of those people. So I understand your argument. But what do you say to them, and then what do you say about the nature of the relationship between the grantor and grantee? Good. All right, let's, let's take the first one. Let me just ask you quickly, if you know, or anyone else from the Gates Foundation, if they're here, knows. For the when you were there making education grants, um, how often did it happen that someone, upon being offered a grant, said, no thanks? Uh, it didn't happen often, but it happened multiple times. Mm -hmm. And I was there from 05 through 10. Yep. I was there from 05 through 10. And there were times where some accepted very large grants and realized once they were into it, they were corrupted. Yeah. I will agree with you about the power. And realized, you know, the Gates Foundation wanted you to expand this charter school model from San Diego around the rest of the country. And the head of the system said, you know, I don't have the stomach for that. Right. I'd rather do it here. Right. And so the object of the foundation was either to agree to their new view or to pull the money back. Right. And it went in both directions. Yeah. OK, so uh, you're absolutely right to describe a philanthropic grant or much philanthropic activity as contractual. The, the moment of sort of democratic legitimacy, if you want to put it that way, is, a, is at the contractual moment of signing the, you know, the, the agreement in which the philanthropic assets are transferred. I think that's a fair way of understanding the way that grant making works. And of course, it bears noting that the laws that permit that very operation have been democratically authorized. The found form of a foundation has been codified by law, democratically approved, and the operation of foundations further so. So there's an, you know, an additional stamp of democratic legitimacy there. Um, I'd want to express a little bit of skepticism, though, that, uh, about the idea that there are there's equally powerful partners at the negotiating table when that grant is accepted. Um, here's an, ex here's a, an example outside of the context of what you were doing, just designed to prime this intuition. Imagine what I think happens sometimes amongst wealthy families who aren't doing philanthropy, but who set up money to transfer to their children. So sometimes people will set up trusts for their children that unlock in various stages across the lifespan. Here's a bunch of money at the age of 18, some more money at the age of 25, some more money at the age of 40. And there's often strings attached to the way that the money can be used by the children, even when they're 25 or 30 or 40 years old, used for educational purposes or something like that. Um, there's no way in which to understand the ability of the child to receive the money as it's making them, in certain material respects, better off. But they might feel like the idea of saying no to their parents to give them money is a non-starter. What would it mean to tell my patron, my parents, 
I don't want your money because of the strings that are attached to it. You have to have, be an extraordinarily powerful individual in your own head to turn down material benefits. So I offer that up just as a way of suggesting that what you describe as an equally powerful moment of contract from the standpoint of the grantee might be seen as somewhat different. Um, and then you had a second thing which was about, remind me. Money to the government. Oh, to right. Spend what would I say to them? Yeah. Uh, I don't have anything especially original to say to them except to say that attitude reflects um, the widespread theme of the couple days here already distrust and disenchantment with democratic institutions. And going, going back to education, I don't believe I've ever heard this from the Gates Foundation, but other educational philanthropists I've heard say um, quite directly that the problem with American education is that it's too democratic. Democratically elected school boards are the root source of the problem of the ineffective delivery of public education, which is to say it's better to have less democracy, or at the very least a different democratic arrangement than we have. Um, to be honest, my, my own educational policy preferences are much more strongly aligned with the Gates Foundation's views than it is with Diane Ravitch. Um, my question here is not find the philanthropists whose, whose views you agree with, but think about the form of philanthropy itself that gives philanthropists the power um, that they have, the largely unaccountable power that they have. So what, what I have to say to Arizona people who express deep distrust of the operation of public agencies which spend the money collected from tax dollars is uh, possibly there are very good reasons to be skeptical about the effective use of tax dollars um, I myself would agree that a large number of school boards are dysfunctional and contribute to bad outcomes in American education. The task is not to bypass them philanthropically, insert philanthropic technocratic expertise um, that eliminates those democratic institutions, but to figure out a way to enhance and rebuild the confidence in democratic institutions so long as you think democratic institutions really are things worth defending. And, um, you know, we often hear more and more these days that people are not merely disenchanted with democracy, but think that various forms of technocratic or authoritarian, you know, benevolent th philanthropic rule might be preferable. All right, I've got a last question. Um, okay, thanks. Um, I should disclose, um, my name is Mark Tursik. I run the Nature Conservancy, so a big nonprofit. And we're supported by a lot of great foundations, most of whom I admire very much. Uh, one observation, though, I think you're right about how you characterized the negotiation. One yeah. side has a lot more party. We, by the way, I can't recall turning down a big gift. But the gifts we get are generally pretty thoughtful. Here's my question, though. Why isn't there more scrutiny and more spotlight on foundations? For example, in our space, all sorts of people hold us accountable. There are the third-party watchdogs, Cherry and Navigator. They annoy us, but they do some good. Right. Journalists of all stripes are always writing stories about us. We generally, I mean, sometimes they're nice, but usually not. Congress sometimes usually does hearings on us. And all of this can kind of wear us down and discourage us, but net-net, it's good. It holds us accountable. I think it makes nonprofits better. Why doesn't the Wall Street Journal do a series on foundations? Who has the best strategies? And you might be able to promote a kind of competition among the foundations. They are generally well-led with great boards. They might choose to disclose more if they were encouraged, if, if there was more attention. But other than you know, a small number of people like you, it's just not even on the, on yeah. the radar screen. Good. So I've got a, a couple of re quick reactions to that. Um, I mean, I guess I want to emphasize, perhaps especially for the audience here, this, this audience, in which I assume there are a lot of people who either receive philanthropic money or are giving the philanthropic money away, that um, in certain respects, the main message I want to deliver is that we need more scrutiny of philanthropy rather than that baseline re reaction or attitude of gratitude and celebration. Um, and that that scrutiny should be welcomed even by the philanthropists because it's a form of learning and accountability that you would think ought to improve their own performance. Um, and the kind of reaction that I sometimes get from people is to resist that because what they'll say is something like the following. Look, um, we know that philanthropy should seek to measure its outcomes. And so it's quite possible that philanthropic money is wasted. And that's lamentable. And we would try not to waste philanthropic money. But at least the donor was trying. Because it can't have been better for the donor just to have bought a third house, another boat, whatever, rather than trying to do something philanthropic 
and failing. Philanthropy always and everywhere is better, the idea it goes, than more private consumption. And in certain respects, that's the attitude I want to dislodge. I don't think philanthropy automatically is better than private consumption, in particular, if there are tax subsidies that attach to philanthropy, which would mean private consumption would generate more tax revenue. That's that Dylan Matthews argument. Um, so, um, to the best of my knowledge, aside from the Chronicle of Philanthropy, which isn't exactly an investigative um, um, entity, there's no major magazine or newspaper that has a philanthropy reporter, a beat reporter. You occasionally see investigative stories. They're often about um, you know, scan various forms of typical corporate abuse and scandal. I'd like to see just more ordinary attention paid to philanthropic activity in the way that people pay attention to corporate activity. Where's the Mike Isaac who writes about Uber for the activity of the Gates Foundation? Now maybe the Gates Foundation would say, God damn it, there are a lot of people who are scrutinizing us. And the Gates Foundation may indeed have um, a good deal of scrutiny because they're the biggest game in town. But for the average philanthropist, there's basically no attention at all. And you can be non-transparent. You, you can operate completely below the horizon. What I want to suggest is it's better for the philanthropist herself, for the professional grant maker, him or herself, if there's public attention and scrutiny, because that provides new opportunities for learning. Um, at the lunchtime conversation, I think it was Clara Miller who offered what I, what I gather is a sort of familiar inside joke amongst donors or grant makers, which is that you, know, you, you cross the street from being a grant recipient to a grant maker, and immediately in a room like this, you're much better looking, much wittier, you're the smartest person in the room. People are in a constant effort to engage your attention deferentially because they're subservient to you and getting money. Um, that makes it really difficult to learn from your grant makers if they're always fearful of pissing you off in some way and have to you know, anoint you as um, a good looking genius. <laughs> um, journalists can fill a void there. Uh, and if there's journalists in the room, I hope some of you will take up that call. Thank you for inviting me here.